It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you our distinguished speaker today, Professor Dina Katabi. Professor Katabi is the Andrew and Erna Beterbi Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT, where she also got her PhD. She is also the director of the Center of Wireless Networks and Mobile Computing. She is a co-founder of Emerald Innovations. For those who don't know, Emerald is a touchless sensors and machine learning platform for health analytics that is already deployed in about 200 homes. Professor Katabi was recognized with multiple prestigious awards, including the ACM Prize in Computing, the ACM Grass Murray Hopper Award, two sitcom test of the time awards, and multiple, multiple, multiple best paper awards that spans over multiple conferences and, uh, and places. There were also several startups such as By Charging and MLM, you just thought about it, about you. Her technical interest spans over digital health, mobile systems, wireless sensing and machine learning. In today's distinguished talk, she will present to us sensing technologies that track people's movement based on radio signals that bounces off their bodies. They can further monitor a per person's breathing, her heartbeats and sleep quality, and they can reveal many other things in a contactless fashion. And uh, saying that, when you have the chance to visit Professor Katabi's wireless lab, or maybe you walk next to it, be careful of the reflecting RF waves and what they can reveal on you behind the walls. With that, I'll leave the floor for Professor Katabi to give us her talk. Thank you. Shukran Basim. Uh, my name is Dina Kitabi. I'm a professor at MIT, and I'm really honored to be here today to present to you our work. Uh, so let me start by sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Uh, Basim, can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Yes, um, so today I'm going to tell you about a new technology for monitoring uh, people and their vital signs. And we monitor them purely using wireless signals and by analyzing this wireless signal using machine learning. So my interest is to bring healthcare to the home. I imagine if we can uh, monitor people breathing, heartbeats, mobility, any health problem, and be able to continuously monitor it in their home, particularly for people who are sick, like patients who have chronic diseases. Now, unfortunately, if you wanna do this today using traditional methods, then you will need wearables such as like, if you are, for example, you wanna monitor somebody breathing, you have to ask them to wear either a nasal probe or a chest band. Uh, if you want to monitor falls, then you have to ask somebody to wear a pendant and then push a, push, push a button when they fall on the floor. And you see here, like on my screen, this person who has these accelerometer on his body. Uh, like if you want to monitor somebody who has Parkinson to see their movements, then you have to put these accelerometers. And this lady here, she has these electrodes on her head and body, and this is for monitoring sleep. So, so these ways of monitoring health using these wearables, I mean, they are useful, but they are definitely not comfortable. Now, what if somebody comes and tells you that we can monitor all of these things for you? We can monitor your breathing, heartbeat, mobility, sleep, sleep stages, all of this, but without putting a single sensor on the person's body. This is exactly what my group at MIT works on. We develop new wireless sensors that look like your Wi-Fi box at home, but they can use the wireless, the wireless signal in the environment, just the electromagnetic waves to monitor your breathing, heartbeat, sleep, uh, mobility, all of that stuff. So we call this um, wireless box the Emerald Box. And 
the way it works, it actually uses machine learning algorithm to analyze the electromagnetic waves in the environment, to analyze the, the wireless signals around you. And from that, it can get the breathing, the heartbeat, all of these signals. And when I tell people this, most of the time they still ask me, okay, so what do people have to wear? Do I have to ask my patient to wear a wristband, for example, or do they have to like write something or tell you something? So no, actually, we only use the wireless signal to monitor people. So let me show you an illustrative example. So here is a home, the wireless signal spread inside the home, it traverses walls on occlusions, and it reflects of our human body because our body is full of water. And some of these reflections, they come back to, uh, to the device and it analyzes them using machine learning here. It will discover a fall and it can alert the, the caregiver via text, email, or uh, phone call. I want to show you some of the example from the lab, our lab at MIT. So uh, this is my student. This is uh, one of the offices that we have in our lab at MIT. Uh, uh, this is a version of our device. And we're going just to put this device in the adjacent office behind the wall. So we want to monitor this person through the wall using the wireless signal, because we know that wireless signals can traverse walls. Now, I want you to, uh, to see the, uh, on the side of the screen, there is a red dot here, and this red dot is going to follow his movements. So let me play this video, and I want you to focus on the red dot on this side. So you see, as he moves, the red dot is going to track his movement. And remember, this is purely based on how his body changes the electromagnetic waves around him there are no sensors on his body. So see the red dot is tracking him. So if you think about it, what, we, what I have showed you is that we can, through the wall, use wireless signal to track how somebody is moving and without even asking them to have a sensor on their body, cell phone, nothing. It's just purely based on how the wireless signal uh, is changed by their movements. So this is actually one of our earlier results. So I want to show you now a similar result, but actually is more powerful. So in this example, you can see this person standing and you see the red dot, but actually you know that it's standing because I'm showing you the image, but if you see the red dot, you know where he is, but you don't know whether he's standing or sitting. Uh, also, when he was moving, you saw the red dot moving with him, but it was sliding. You didn't know whether he was moving with the right foot or the left foot. So now I want to show you our recent result. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, I'm going to show you how we can track people and just get the full skeleton of the person. So now, actually, this is the, the, these are the people inside the room you see here. And these skeletons actually what the wireless device see from outside the room through the wall. So let me play this video for you. So now you see as a person sits, you see he's sitting, you see a full skeleton sitting. And when he, he walks, you see which leg, like he's moving with the left or, uh, foot or right foot. And remember all of this using wireless signals through walls. So now, this is very uh, interesting to the research community when we presented these results that you can actually see people through walls with wireless signal. But we were very much interested in using this information for health. And you might be wondering, like, how is this related to health? But actually, if you are thinking about a variety of diseases that are related to movement disorders like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, uh, Huntington's, all of those diseases, they are actually assessed when people develop drugs, for example, for Parkinson, they are looking at the gait of the Parkinson patients and they do something called a uh, six minute walking test. So if we can monitor the gait and the walking speed of people continuously in their home and how they are moving, then we can actually get information that are very important for assessing these diseases, whether Parkinson, multiple scler sclerosis, and others. 
Now, also gait and movement are very important for health in general. Like if you consider even diseases that it seems that they are not related to gait, like uh, congestive heart disease or uh, COPD, which is pulmonary disease. In those diseases, actually the gait changes because when we get tired, if, if, you, if your heart is not working well or you have exacerbation of COPD or congested heart disease, then you are not going to be able to move as much as you, you are usually moving and be able to track that could indicate early, early exacerbations of COPD or CHF. Not only this, but also fatigue. Fatigue is a general sign of, uh, of not feeling well, and that shows up in our mobility. So, so far I showed you that we can track the gait of a person. And now, if you think about it with such a device in the home, we can know where the person is. So not only we can track their gait, but also we can tell something about behavior, for example, uh, how often they go to the kitchen and are they going to the kitchen three times, for example, per day, like for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Uh, basically, how do they spend their day? Are they active or just sitting on the TV couch and not doing anything? All of these are very important health parameters, particularly when you look for elderly people, for the old ones, because how much they move, whether they are getting food properly, all of that impacts their health. Sleep actually is very important. And I don't know about the situation in Saudi Arabia, but in the US, for example, one in every three Americans has sleep problems. So one of the things that we wanted to monitor with this technology is sleep. And you might be sitting there and say, oh yeah, I understand how you could potentially monitor sleep because your device probably sees a person as they go to bed, when they stop tossing around in bed and when they leave the bed. So that would be a measure of sleep that is called ectigraphy, basically a measure only based on, on movements. But it turned out that we can actually measure something much deeper in terms of sleep. So when you go to sleep, your brain waves change and you enter different stages. These stages are awake, light sleep, deep sleep, and REM or rapid eye movements. So these sleep stages are different. For example, in uh, rapid eye movement is related to depression, for example. If, if somebody, um, one of the signs of depression is rapid eye movement starts happening early in the sleep. Uh, deep sleep actually has been, there is some literature that shows that deep sleep is related, the slow wave during deep sleep are related to Alzheimer's. So if if you actually can monitor sleep stages, of course, you get a lot of information about sleep. You can get information related to sleep disorders, but not just that, you also get information that are related to a variety of diseases, such as depression or Alzheimer and cognitive diseases. So how do you monitor sleep today? So today, if you wanna monitor sleep, you send your patient to the sleep lab or the hospital. They put all of these sensors on his head and body and they ask him to sleep like this. Now, of course, this is not a very easy way to sleep because I mean, you have all of the stuff on, on your head and body. And also you can do this only occasionally because you do it in a sleep lab. So let me show you how we monitor sleep uh, with our Emerald device. So here is our device. It transmits very low power wireless signal, analyzes the reflection using machine learning and spits out the sleep stages throughout the night, awake, REM, light sleep, deep sleep. And you can see this person here, he's sleeping in his own bedroom on his own bed. There is nothing on his head. It's just completely comfortable the usual way. And not only that we can monitor sleep, we can actually also monitor breathing. This person sitting there like you, and this is what you see is his inhale, exhale. We ask him to hold his breath and you can see the signal stays steady because he exhaled, he did not inhale. Now, if you zoom in on the signal, this is the same breathing signal. You can see the inhales and the exhales. So you see this, this breathing signal goes up and down. You see exhales, inhales, but you see also these small blips on the signal here, for example, these blimps actually are not noise. There are his heartbeats. So not only we can monitor 
sleep, respiration, but also we can monitor things that are minute, like the pulsing of your blood that, create, that is associated with your heart beats. So, and I want to emphasize that for every one of these metrics, we compare it with a gold standard. So when we, when we talk about sleep, for example, we compare with the standard way people monitor sleep using EEG signal. Uh, when we, when we uh, talk about uh, respiration, we compare it with the respiration that comes from chest band, and we show that all of our measurements are highly accurate and compatible with the gold standard. Now, I wanna just take a few minutes to tell you a bit more about how it works. So I'm not gonna have enough time uh, to get into the actual detail of the technology, but I'm going to tell you very high level how it works. So I'm sure all of you guys know about radar. So radar is used typically to detect airlines, uh, to detect flights or airlines in, in the sky, to detect planes. So if you have radar, you can just like look at the sky and detect those planes, like the, the figure that I'm showing here. And that would be using wireless signal. So if you think about it, like what I showed you to some extent look like radar, it should remind you of radar because we are traversing walls and we are having some signal that reflects off the person's body and we are analyzing these signals. But of course, it's not just radar because radar is uh, requires very, very high power. So when you transmit at a very high power to the sky and that is, uh, it's not possible. We cannot transmit at such a high power toward the person. I mean, first, this is not legal and second, it would just not be possible. And second, uh, so we transmit at much, much lower power than radar. The second thing is that the sky is empty. So you actually have only like, if you are lucky, you find one plane or two planes, but the sky is empty. In contrast, when you are trying to detect a person in an environment or even detect something even smaller, their, their uh, breathing signal or heart, heartbeat, there is so much noise and there is so many reflections. The signal not only reflects of the human body, but reflects of the walls, of the furniture, of the laptop, of everything. So you have a mess of reflections. So you have to deal with that. So instead of just using radar technology, so we actually use a more sophisticated technology that has two components. On the one hand, we have designed very sensitive radios that can analyze the wireless signal at and extract the information from it. On the one hand, we have machine learning algorithm, deep neural network that analyze these wireless signal. And I'm sure you guys have heard about the revolution, the AI revolution and how deep neural networks are changing everything. And deep neural network now are uh, used in uh, analyzing images, analyzing audio and text. So here we use them to analyze radio signal. So you can think about the radios like the ear of the device. So it has to be very sensitive to, to hear these minute wireless reflections from the human body. And the machine learning is like the brain of the device. It allows us to analyze and understand these minute reflections so that we can say, oh yeah, this is Dina's breathing. This is her heartbeat. So, so far I showed you that we have this technology that can analyze the uh, monitor people, analyze their physiological signals completely passively without touching them. So uh, over the last two years, we have been using this technology to help doctors and patients to better understand diseases, better attend to the patient and even develop new drugs. And uh, we have been using this with diseases, with various diseases. So I'm just here listing a few diseases that we have used the Emerald device with the patient with those diseases, Parkinson's, FSHD, Alzheimer's, atopic dermatitis, COPD, Crohn's. And I'm going to show you some of the results from monitoring patients with these kinds of diseases in their own homes. So let's look at this. Okay, so first I wanna show you the device itself. So here, like what you see this, this is our device. As you can see, it's very simple. It's just a box that sits on the wall, like a picture frame. And it's like your Wi-Fi box. 
and it doesn't need to 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 uh, to have any sensors on the person's body. It just analyzes the wireless signal in the environment. Now, using this box, we worked with uh, patients and doctors in variety of diseases. So, first, let me show you some of our results with Parkinson's uh, patients. Uh, so let me explain what this is. So this is our device here, this rectangle that you see on the screen is the emerald device. Uh, this is a patient, this is somebody who has Parkinson's and he, this is, we deployed the device in his, uh, in his uh, residence. Uh, the person lives in assisted living community. So he has this room here, which is his bedroom. And this is the bathroom. And actually in this region, there is a small kitchen, like there is a microwave and he can do like cook uh, certain things. And what you see is this blue line is the trajectory of his movement. So this is two hour trajectory and you can see it moves between the bed. It, then there is this chair. So he sits on this chair and this is the kitchen area. And then he enters the bathroom, he comes back, he's just moving around. So what we do, we take all of these trajectories and we analyze them and try to understand the patient's life. Okay, so let me show you what we get after analyzing these trajectories. So this, this graph summarizes the life of this patient. So this graph is for this patient in this sitting. So this graph is for two months. So every circle here on this graph, every circle is one day. And it starts from zero, which is midnight and goes all the way. This is 12, that is noon. And it goes back to zero again, which is the next day. So the innermost circle is the first day of the study and the outermost circle is the last day of the study. And as we said, every day is one circle. Now let's look at this patient. So let's look at the blue, which is the, the, uh, when the patient is in, in the bed asleep. And we can see that at the beginning of the study here near the center of the graph, blue is very fragmented. So sleep is disastrous. I mean, the patient is hardly getting any sleep. You see the blue is just so fragmented. And indeed in Parkinson, sleep is a big problem. And uh, you can see as the study progresses, and uh, as we get closer to the end of the study, actually the blue is getting consolidated and his sleep has improved drastically. So what else can you tell from this graph? So you look at this graph and you say, oh, green, it's all over the place. What is the green? Green actually is refers to sitting on this chair here. Like you remember here, I told you he, that he has this chair and he actually loves to sit on this chair. So you see like green all over the place. So he's, most of his life, this is the patient just sitting on a chair. So you see like he wakes up in the morning, sits on a chair. And then he like throughout the day, he's sitting on the chair. And then he, before he goes to sleep, mostly between uh, 18, which is 6 p.m. Uh, to until he goes to sleep, he's just sitting on a chair. So this is very worrisome because this is mean that the person is very sedentary. Like they are not doing much in their life other than sitting on a chair. And then I want you to look at yellow. Yellow is when he goes to the bathroom. So you see a cone of yellow here around 8 a.m. So it means that this person goes to do his showering and toileting around 8 a.m. So when, when I and my, when my, my student and myself, we looked at this graph, we were just like, okay, why somebody would wake up? Like if you see here, he would wake up around 3, 4 a.m. in the morning, sits on a chair until 8 a.m. to do his showering and toileting. Why is that? And then the doctor looked at it and said, oh, this patient cannot do showering and toileting on his own. So he's waiting until the, the nurse or the health worker comes in the morning at 8 a.m. to help him with showering. So, so that actually tells you a lot because it tells you that the patient is in a state that is really bad, like they cannot even shower on their own. So then you see also this cone of white here around 18. 18 is 6 p.m., so between 5 and 6 p.m. in the afternoon. And so why it means the patient is outside the coverage area of the wireless signal. So he leaves his room between 5 and 6 p.m. here every single day, except for this day he came back, he came back early. So this is actually because he, he 
every night he goes and has he has dinner with the rest of the assisted living community with the other people in the same retirement home except for this day you see that he he came back early because he wasn't feeling well so what do you get from this graph we spent so much time on this but actually what you get from this is that by putting something that looks like a smarter wi-fi box in someone's home now you got a full picture about their health without even asking them a single question and that exactly is what is very useful for doctors particularly doctors that are caring for older people and particularly if that old person lives alone and do you really have no information about how they are doing so let me let me zoom in on sleep in particular. So these are six Parkinson patients. And uh, what I'm showing you here is just the sleep of this patient. So I want you to look first at this one where my cursor is. So you see that this person goes to sleep around 11 p.m., wakes up around 6 a.m. in the morning. Like many of us, fairly normal. Now look at this one here. The sleep is all over the place, is very fragmented, very irregular. And just like you wonder, how would anyone can, how can anyone live like this? They are asleep or awake any time during the day. So in fact, as I said, in Parkinson's, sleep is a big problem. And all of these six patients that I'm showing you, there are six Parkinson patients, but their sleep is very different. And by knowing how bad and what is the status of the sleep of the different patients, the doctor actually can help them. There are, there are drugs that you can give to help with the sleep. But first, we have to have a good understanding of the status of sleep of these patients. Now, the other thing that you have to keep in mind when you are working with older patients is that many of them can, like they forget, they cannot report things correctly. So like they can't tell you how bad their sleep is in some cases, particularly if people started to have dementia. So having something that is objective is very important. So another thing that we monitored is opioids. So in the US, there is a, uh, a crisis, an opioid crisis. People are taking opioid and they are having opioid overdose. So what we wanted to see, we wanted to see whether we can help understand the, the impact of opioid on the, on, the, uh, on the physiological signal. And in fact, when we started the study, I mean, we, we were working with people who don't, whose problem is actually not opioid. So we, uh, we, have, we were monitoring people who have a disease called endometriosis. And endometriosis disease is a disease that causes a lot of pain. So basically here, what we have on the X axis is the day. And on the Y axis, every day, the patient is, uh, tell us how, how, how much pain she felt. So like, for example, she can say, oh, my pain level is four, or my pain level is five, etc." And so each one, each one of these dots is for a particular day. But you see here, like there is one time when the patient uh, pain was very high. So her pain went to the to level eight, and she actually took a medication called oxycodone, which is opioid based medication. And now, if you look at the sleep, uh, the sorry, the breathing of the patient on these days, you see that on the same day that she took the oxycodone, her breathing went down. She got a breathing depression. Now, this is actually a sign that it's a mild sign of overdose that basically the breathing started suffering and she got breathing depression because of this, this drug that has opioids. So again, even like we can just by having such a smarter wireless box in someone's home, we can monitor uh, whether they are taking, like whether they are having opioid overdose and their impact on their respiration. I want to tell you something about how we monitor COVID-19, because I mean, I'm sure you guys also in Saudi Arabia, you have been uh, like have uh, like been uh, in the same situation that all of us in the world are in. Like in, over the last year, we had uh, we have been all struggling with COVID-19 and trying to help patients who have COVID-19. And uh, in COVID-19 or coronavirus, basically when somebody has a coronavirus, what happens is that they, uh, 
they, they, they go to the doctor, they, 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 there is a decision that, okay, this patient has coronavirus, but then uh, unless the patient is in a very bad state, those patients are asked to go back home and to quarantine and self-isolate in the home. And if their uh, situation gets worse, to seek medical help. But if you look at somebody who has coronavirus, what happens is that at the end of the first week, the beginning of the second week, things can actually evolve and they can have, uh, they can start having uh, a breathing depression or breathing problems. And if they are at home self-isolating, the patient himself or herself might not notice that they are actually starting to have problems. And as a result, we see in the US many cases where the patient is rushed to the hospital too late and they have to be put immediately on a ventilator. So the question becomes, can we actually monitor these patients who are recovering in their home to see whether they are actually re recovering, things are moving in the right direction or whether there are problems and these patients need help. So we, we worked with some of the assisted living community in the, in, in the Boston area, and we monitored patients who have COVID-19. And let me show you some of this monitoring. So this is the first time anyone monitored a COVID-19 patient with wireless signal. So what you see here is the respiration of the patient. And this is the respiration when on April 7, actually, let me just... So you see that the respiration is very, uh, it's high breathing rate, 23 breaths per minute. Now this on April 11, which is four days later, you see that the ups and downs now are wider, which means that the breathing rate went down. So the breathing rate is only 18 breaths per minute. So in fact, this patient is recovering. This is a good thing. So when, when you have the disease, typically your breathing rate increases and as the person recovers, the breathing rate goes down. So the patient was recovering properly. Another sign of good recovery is uh, mobility. So you see this is again April 8th and this is April 11. And we are looking at how, how mobile the patient is. So let me play this again and see the patient in both cases moving from the chair to the bathroom, but it's much faster on April 11. see it again. So we can see that this patient is uh, improving, the mobility is improving, the respiration is improving, so things are better. But uh, unfortunately, not always things are better. Uh, sometimes this is not the case. So some of the things that we see with patients that are suffering is like their sleep, for example. We see that sometimes the patients have very long REM at the beginning, the first cycle of sleep. So remember, I told you about sleep stages. So for people who, who never seen these graphs before, so what happens, this patient went to sleep slightly before 10 p.m. and then went to light sleep and then few excursion to deep sleep and then she entered REM. And you can see your REM is very long here, 90 minutes of REM. Now for people like me or you, for people who are healthy, you typically get only on average 10 minutes of REM in your first cycle. So having 90 minutes of REM in the first cycle is not, it's not the normal thing. So, and we always, REM is the stage in during which typically people dream. So uh, this is could be associated with what we hear typically from COVID patient that there are these vivid dreams and hallucinations. So as I mentioned also, not always things are, are, are good. I mean, and sometimes the patient, most of the times, I mean, hopefully the patient is recovering and things are improving. But I wanna show you that also sometimes patients struggle. So this is actually the breathing of one of the patients. This is abnormal breathing. Remember the breathing should be up and down, down, like basically going up and down in inhales and exhales. But here you see the inhales and the exhales are completely disrupted. Like you see, this is like very long, this is very narrow here, and it's just abnormal breathing pattern. And in fact, breathing is very, very important. If you can monitor breathing, there are many signs that you can get about whether the patient is doing well and is recovering, or actually there are some problems. So let me show you this graph as an illustration. So this is the case for a patient who actually ended up having to be taken again back to the hospital. So this is again a COVID patient. Let me explain this. So 
every one of these blue curves is a histogram of the respiration rate of this patient. And here you see like the day, you see April 8th, and you see the respiration uh, as a histogram. And you can see the respiration rate here at the beginning, like this peak, the mode of the respiration is about 18 breaths per minute. Now, this patient, her, her respiration rate was improving. It was just like the, 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 the peak was decreasing and she was like, because her respiration was improving. And then suddenly on, on April 14, you see the respiration rate is jumping. And in fact, it was a case where that was a bad sign and eventually the patient ended up in the hospital. The patient spent about one week in the hospital and then she came back from the hospital here and we see again, the respiration is, in, is decreasing and the patient eventually, eventually recovered. But what this tells us is by monitoring respiration, we get, get a sign whether somebody is recovering or somebody actually is facing some problem and potentially they are going to end up in the hospital very soon. So let me show you about the, uh, like we, we did a study with COVID patient and we, I'm gonna show you three types of patients. So there are patients who actually suffered and uh, were, were sent to the hospital again. And this is the patient that I showed you before. And there are patients who actually recovered and you can see their respiration improving over time uh, throughout. And then you can see we all hear about asymptomatic patient, people who actually have COVID, but they don't have any symptom. It's like as if they don't have uh, as if they don't have COVID, and you can see that their respiration is very stable. They have no problem. So by monitoring these patients in their home, we can actually discover who is recovering well, who is having some trouble, and alert the doctor without having to to have anyone get close to the patient because we can just monitor them without any touch using wireless signal, and therefore we don't have a risk of contagion. So, so this gets me to the end of my talk, and I introduced to you this new technology that we call Emerald. It's really something that is, is it's a box, it's a wireless box, much like your Wi-Fi box that sits in the background of the home and can analyze the physiological signals. And from that, it can get information about the health of the patients. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna finish with two points. The first one is about privacy and security. So of course, when you have a device that can uh, go, can see people through walls and get their physiological signal, it's very important to pay attention to privacy because we want to be uh, careful uh, maintaining the privacy of the patient, maintaining the privacy of everyone. So in our case, actually, there are multiple measures that we, we take in, uh, to ensure that the privacy of everyone is protected. So in particular, the, uh, the, all the data, of course, is encrypted. No, uh, all experiments are uh, reviewed by the ethical committee, uh, the IRB board in our institution to make sure that it's, it's ethical. The patient, every time like we monitor someone, the patient has to sign a consent form and say, yeah, I understand this is a monitoring and I'm willing to have this monitoring. And also all the information is encrypted and anonymized in the sense that it is separated from any information about who the patient is and is stored separately from the ID of the patient. Uh, so we, we pay a lot of attention to privacy and sustaining privacy and only Ha, the, the only person who has access to the data is the patient or the, the somebody that the patient allow give, to give them access. So that's the one thing that I wanted to, to emphasize. The last thing I want to emphasize is the future. Like if you think about the future of healthcare, today we talk about healthcare being very, uh, very expensive. We talk about people becoming, uh, we see aging population because people now live longer. And as a result, uh, a very large percentage of the population is old population. And for old people, in many cases, they might be living alone and they need some help. And imagine a future where actually healthcare can be provided to the patient in their own home. And you can just, if somebody is, 
like an old, uh, like a grandma is old and she lives alone in her home, there can be a device in the home that is checking on the health of grandma all the time. And if there is a problem detected early on, alert alert the doctor and the caregiver so that we can intervene before this problem escalates. I believe this is going to be the future of healthcare. We have to do something because healthcare cost is increasing. And we have to do something because the population is aging and we need to be able to deliver the care in people's own homes. So with this, I'm going to stop and tell you that really what we are looking for is to move from wearables to the invisible. This is my email if in case you want to contact me. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing my screen and take any questions. Thank you, many. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kateb. It is very, very interesting talk indeed with a lot of technical details. And uh, indeed, uh, we have received uh, tons of questions, but uh, I, I, I really shortened them to 10 of the, to ten questions. I hope we have uh, enough time to, to have all, yes. all of them answered. So uh, I, the way I divide the question is that the first patch is going to be about the signal itself. So people are asking about RF being scattered, absorbed, reflected, Will it actually work when you have multiple people in the same area to be monitored or no? Yes, yes. So actually, I, I show you examples that have a single person just because it's easier visually to, to see. Actually, I showed you multiple. I showed you an example that has multiple people. Remember, like the skeletons uh, with three yes. people walking and sitting. So actually, it can monitor multiple people, as you, show, you saw in that example. Of course, it doesn't matter if you have hundreds of people or it's just it's it's for it's designed for a living environment where like if you have a home have five people in the home that's no problem and that brings me actually to a follow-up question on the same topic how how are you be sure that the reflected signal comes from the person that you actually would like to monitor yeah, so this is a very important question. Of course, you don't want to say, oh, grandma is great, but actually you are monitoring the, uh, <laughs> the young kid there. But so the, the point is that we have, uh, we have a machine learning classifier that is trained with the signal of the particular person of interest. So for the first uh, two weeks of the monitoring, like for some time, we ask the patient to wear a small accelerometer. Actually, I do have the accelerometer, it's very small. So we ask them to wear it just for a short period at the beginning, not because we want the acceleration, but because we want to like create a, uh, a classifier for that particular patient of interest. So we want to uh, say, okay, when this, these are the RF signals that are reflected from this person. And we train the classifier and once the, the classifier is trained, it knows this particular person. So it doesn't, it doesn't know anyone else, but it can tell this is a person of interest. I don't care about the other people. And then actually it, uh, it can assign the, the, the ID to that person. Yeah. So the next batch of questions, actually three of them, in fact, is about the Emerald box. And I see there is a lot of excitement from the audience about uh, how are they, how are they built, whether there will be interference with them. Actually, a very interesting question came just now. Can we really modify our existing routers at homes to imitate what Emerald can do? Or this is a hardware specific issue that is not a software part. Another also interesting question, where is the data being processed? We know machine learning is a heavy processing requirement. So where, where do you deal with this data? I'm sure that you don't deal with them in the box itself. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so, so these are very interesting questions. So let's, let's take them one, one question at a time. <laughs> uh, so the first question is, can I modify my off-the-shelf router? Unfortunately, no, because the current routers are... Um, Basically, they are designed to to carry communication information, so they don't have the sensitivity that we need in in the signal to to be able to capture these very minute reflections. So, in fact, we design our own boxes. Uh, I mean, hopefully, in the future, these will be like available on on the market again, like uh, same way as uh, a Wi-Fi router. But it's. Uh, Currently, the, the existing Wi-Fi routers do not have the capacity to do this and the sensitivity of the signal that we need for, for being able to get the minute signal that is important for monitoring physiological information. Uh, so this is the first uh, question. How, how are they built? 
Uh, so we uh, we started this research as a project inside my group at MIT. We spin out a startup company, and currently uh, we still build prototypes at MIT. And the startup company builds uh, build boxes that are professional product boxes. Uh, what is the next question? <laughs> where, where the data is being processed. Where is the data processed? So yeah, it's you're right in the sense that machine learning algorithms are computationally heavy. So it's very hard to process them on the device itself. But what it's kind of like the device does the very initial thing, which is to compress the electromagnetic waves because also the electromagnetic waves are huge. You cannot just send them to the cloud. But the machine learning algorithms themselves, they run in the cloud. Yeah. So the next uh, batch of questions, I'm still getting questions, by the way, as we speak, as I'm answering, but uh, I'm gonna make it short. So uh, the first question is all related to the biological aspects of, of, of the RF. And I'm sure that you have been asked these questions before, but here, uh, how accurate are these measures compared to the touch-based biological sensors that you can put in the body? Yeah, so, so actually they are more accurate. Uh, and you might be surprised, but I, I think I should I should say it slightly differently. So there is the gold standard. So let's take let's take sleep. So that to give you a very good example. So sleep actually, if you want the most accurate sleep, you have to put electrodes, EEG electrode, on the person's head, uh, like the woman I showed at the beginning, and the guy with the full suit of uh, sensors that I showed. So, so if you do that, then you get the most accurate thing. But not only this, there is also a person who comes like a sleep technician who comes and look at these signals and manually for every 30 seconds, that person has to say, okay, this is light sleep, deep sleep, REM. So, so if, you, if you do all of that stuff, then you are getting the gold standard. That's, that's, how, that's the best we know about how to do sleep. But... Typically, when you are, I'm guessing your question is really not about putting all of these electrodes because this is just not really doable. Or uh, you get these uh, sleep sensors like Fitbit or something. Yes. And this is actually, it gives you some understanding of your sleep, but it's not very accurate because really what it is measuring is exactly the movement of your arm. So if you are watching TV for a long period and you are not moving your arm at all, uh, or moving it very little, then that is equivalent from their perspective to, to sleep typically. And if uh, so, it's really based on movement and it's based on the movement of a single body part. While the wireless signal actually can get a holistic view of your whole body. And even like the twitching, you'll be surprised. Like I showed you that actually it has the sensitivity to capture the pulsing of the blood. So actually also like when, when, when you are in REM, these muscles around the eye twitch. And that also, the, the wireless signal is sensitive enough. So if you compare with wearables, if you get the sleeve from the wearable, actually the wireless signal is more sensitive. But if you compare with the gold standard, with putting all of the EEG and having a sleep technician come and uh, all of that stuff, of course, that is more sensitive. That's the gold standard. Yes. So uh, one more question is about the biological signals usually contains a lot of noise uh, in a sense that uh, even the ph physiological signals always uh, or like solving the interference and the noise that comes from uh, this uh, frustration signal is always a problem. So do you implement like signal denoising issues, especially when you want to insert this data in your machine learning box? Yeah, yeah. So, so there, I mean, I, of course, I couldn't talk about all of the technical stuff. Of course, there are many um, signal processing algorithms that we use and different algorithms are more targeted toward different signals and uh, in addition to the machine learning algorithms. Uh, so, of course, we do all of this stuff, but the thing that I want to emphasize to you also is that one, one of the problem also with physiological signals, so again, let me take sleep because it's, it's kind of like uh, easy to, to, to think about it. We all know enough about sleep. So if you measure something once or very occasionally, then you are more sensitive to noise. I mean, we all know that the variance decreases with the number of measurements. So uh, basically, if you want to reduce the impact of noise on your study, you do more measurements. Uh, so be able to monitor people in their home 
continuously and without asking them you don't have to go and ask mom or dad please wear a sensor and please take your measurement and please do this and please do that and they are going to forget and not do it or you have to send them to the doctor and when they go to the doctor they take a few measurements but they don't like it's just one day it can be a good day it can be a bad day so so uh, so of course we do all of the uh, signal processing to reduce the noise, but I'm just saying that being able to get more measurement on its own reduces the variance, therefore it reduces the noise in your signal. Yes. Uh, I truly appreciate the fact that you talked about security because you saved us uh, from tons of questions and privacy. But here I, I have a question myself. Yes, cryptography is important, encryption is very important, but these are somehow on the higher, higher level. But since we are talking about RF signal and reflections, have you thought of like signal secrecy uh, and, and doing uh, secrecy at the signal level, at the physical layer level? Yeah, so um, basically the, the uh, we, we thought of a variety of things. So as you said, you can do things at the signal level, uh, I think the 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 uh, when somebody else wants to get these signals, I mean because I mean without getting too much into the details of of, of the waveform and signal processing, I mean you can of course code these signals. I mean these uh, and you can have your own special code that is unknown. And because because the same device is transmitting and receiving the signals, it's, it's very easy. You don't even need to share a secret. It's the same device. Uh, so, so you can do all of these things. So, in principle, you can, but the, the 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 if you if you if you do that, uh, it's it's an additional complexity that the current device doesn't do this. But the, but it's all possible to do as you mentioned. But the current device is quite secure in the sense that even if you got the signal, even if you, if you capture the signal again, remember the signal is is in relation to a signal that was transmitted. So you don't have, you only have one part of the signal, you don't have the other part of the signal. So it has a lot of noise. And also you don't know how to separate that signal. And also, as I said, the the, the signal itself is, uh, the device itself, there is a, a um, what you call it, um, the device is one directional. So it's only facing internally. And one of the things that we call in computer science, uh, a challenge response. So I can ask you, you can do even on another test, I can uh, ask you, okay, so you're telling me that you are monitoring yourself and your home. Why don't you take a step backward and show me that you are that person standing in front of the device or take a step to the left or another step to the left. And if you fail, then you fail the challenge and then you are trying to like uh, uh, cheat the device to monitoring something else that you don't have control over. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one last question and I have a comment later on. Is machine learning models uh, robust against environmental changes, especially when the patients uh, actually improve over time or unfortunately uh, do not improve over time? Yeah, so, so uh, they are, to, to, I mean, it depends on what, what is it. So uh, if, you are, if you are extracting, if you are using machine learning to extract, again, sleep stages, for example. So we extract sleep stages for people who are uh, all types type of people. It's not just like healthy individual. We also compared with unhealthy individual like the Parkinson people that I showed you. So, I mean, the person is moving within the spectrum of all the possible sleep types and sleep stages and all of that stuff. Uh, they are improving or getting worse. Yes. But of course, it, there are, it depends. There, are, there might be other type of machine learning classifier or machine learning model that you train, but you train only on a subset that is uh that has certain property but as the patient leaves that subset or exit that distribution that you trained with then the the, the machine learning model becomes unsuit uh, not suitable for that particular person wonderful so uh, we also in the networking lab initiated the recent uh, research on the same trend but we are not believer of any signals we believe of the signal of people so we come up with a concept called communication via brief 
communication via breath is basically is a biosensors that you can place while I am talking to you, of course, in person, but not by Zoom. <laughs> so uh, when you are talking to people, you, they can emit bioinformation and this bioinformation can be analyzed with different profiling of people. And we also use machine learning in our lab to predict if this guy is, is normal or healthy or not healthy. So uh, we use the breath as being the communication channel. So we go beyond the RF in my opinion. <laughs> So with this, actually, I would love to thank our distinguished, distinguished, distinguished speaker, Professor Katabi, for accepting to be with us today, to give us this exciting lecture, latest age technology, uh, and uh, teaching us really that RF is not only for communication or for WhatsApping or for Facebooking, it's for health, it's for everything, it's for predicting everything beyond the walls. She teaches us every day, we memorize all her papers from the first day that she publishes until 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 now. So with that, I would also like to thank all our audience who joined us in this really distinguished talk uh, over today. And uh, thank you very much for everyone. Thanks, Basim. Thanks, everyone. Uh, shukran, tia. Have fun. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.